name is Joy Shepherd. I'm with Chamberlain Dunn. Um, we're the creators and organizers of the Advancing Healthcare Awards. And these awards are for allied health professionals, healthcare scientists, and those who work, who long, work alongside them. For the past 25 years, um, the awards have highlighted the often overlooked contribution that these health professions have made to prevention, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, and rehabilitation. By now, we should have celebrated our 2020 winners, um, but unfortunately, we've had to postpone to a virtual event in October, and that will be on the 16th, and we do hope that you can join us for that. Please do put it in the, the diary. <coughs> And it seems like a very long time ago since we were um, on the judging day in February. So the gap has given us time to focus on our finalists and that brings us today here to talk about their work and what they've experienced during COVID and what the future is looking like going forward. Uh, the gap has also allowed us to recognize some incredible contributions from our community through our esteem awards and you can find all of those on the gallery on our website. Um, before we get going, I'd just like to mention the publication um, of the Green Awards. Um, this is an initiative of collection of green ideas from our community, um, which was sponsored by DEFRA for their year of, of green action. And you can find all of those um, on our website as well. So um, today we'll be hearing from the three finalists of the Scottish Government's Award for Driving Improvement, Delivering Results. It's an award for healthcare scientists demonstrating expertise, driving improvement, and maximizing the contribution to healthcare science. And we're delighted to welcome Karen Stewart as our chair today from the Scottish Government. And uh, she's going to be introducing the speakers and handing over to them um, to hear more from them. So over to you, Karen. Many thanks. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, to Ali from Chamberlain Dunn for the um, invite to chair this session. Um, and thank you, Joy, for um, the introduction there. So um, I'm Karen Stewart. I'm the healthcare science officer for the Scottish Government. Um, and it gives me great pleasure, actually, to introduce um, our three speakers or um, selection of speakers in respect of the finalists for the Scottish Government Award uh, Driving Improvement um, this, this award um, is worthy to know that it's actually one of many awards that the uh, UK Advancing Healthcare um, offers uh, for AHPs and healthcare science. So a little bit about the Scottish Government Award. Um, it's open to all healthcare scientists across uh, the UK. It asks that you demonstrate your knowledge and your expertise in driving improvement and maximising the contribution that healthcare science can clearly play across a multitude of um, boundaries across health and social care. We're looking obviously to develop services that are sustainable going forward. Um, it, looks that, it looks for the applicants to um, recognise their ambitions in improving quality and safety and most importantly uh, patient experiences of, of good quality care. There's a particular focus around improving the health of the population um, and ensuring that we deliver our services in an equitable and value-based way. So how the session will run is that we have uh, three uh, speakers, so three sessions. They each have 10 minutes and we will open up to uh, questions after each speaker. And uh, there is an opportunity to put your questions in the chat box. Um, and if time allows, we will do a mop-up session of questions at the end that we can open up to, uh, to all our speakers. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers first speaker, who is um, Ash Gilka. Um, Ash is a lead clinical analyst uh, for the London Ambulance Service and uh, the work that Ash has been leading on and implementing is to uh, develop a, an en route, an online point of care testing service for the London Ambulance Service. So may I hand over uh, to Ash? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Karen and, um, and Ali, for, for this opportunity to, to talk about um, the project that we submitted for the, um, for the Advanced Healthcare Award. Um, this particular project um, is an offshoot of a previous project um, that looked at connectivity of point-of-care testing devices to um, uh, an acute hospital uh, electronic healthcare system. Um, and that was conducted in 2014. 
that particular study looked at um, the impact of point of care testing on patient waiting times within a busy A&E department and proved to be beneficial um, in that environment. Um, so as an offshoot of that particular project, um, we, we wanted to look at um, implementing point of care testing devices more upstream. So the idea came to us to perhaps possibly implement point of care testing devices within the ambulance um, environment, whether that be ambulance headquarters, such as the London Ambulance Service and the fleet of ambulances that they that that reside in that. So, um, so to that end, we we approached London Ambulance Service. So, to give you a background, I work at Guys and St Thomas's Hospital. So, I'm a, I'm also working there as a lead clinical analyst. And uh, two years ago, we approached London Ambulance Service with this proposal to look at implementing um, the ISTAT the Abbott ISTAT um, point of care testing devices within their um, ambulance service, in particular the uh, advanced paramedics. Um, so we, so we, we, it led to discussions that, um, that came to the decision that we should perhaps conduct a feasibility study or a uh, proof of concept. So we designed a seven, a seven month trial um, and um, we looked at um, a cohort of 65 patients out of 697 patients that were attended. And we utilized those for that particular feasibility study. So we basically chose um, uh, through an ambulance, um, ambulances or response cars for the study and also uh, highly trained um, advanced paramedics to conduct the feasibility study. And, um, and some of the results were favorable. So we, we looked at um, um, how the early intervention or triage stage within the ambulance setting can lead to immediate interventions and improved referral pathways. And for 40 of the patients within the feasibility study, it actually led to um, emergency admissions to A&E being avoided altogether. So you can, you can see the, um, the potential of, um, of implementing point of care testing diagnostics uh, within that ambulance setting. So the next phase of the project we, and since COVID came along, obviously that threw a spanner in the works as it did for many other um, <laughs> clinical areas and projects. So uh, what we want to look at in, in the near future is to look at connectivity of the point of care testing devices to um, to hospital EHR systems and also to the um, systems within the London Ambulance Service headquarters itself. So uh, what we want to do, we kind of worked out a way of, of um, establishing the connectivity between the point of care testing devices from ambulances to um, the London Ambulance Service headquarters. Now this is gonna to prove, to be, it's going to prove to be technically challenging, but we believe we have a process that will, that is feasible. So we, use, we, we might be able to utilize a, um, a connectivity solution um, entailing a virtual private network connection and possibly util utilizing 5G wireless connectivity, but that, that remains in discussion phase. So once we establish the connectivity, I think that will kind of um, tie the loose ends for this project and give us a complete connective, connected solution for point of care testing devices within ambulances. The, the, this concept could obviously potentially save numerous lives um, via the identification of specific cardiac markers, for example, such as troponin I, um, potassium, for, for various um, cardiac conditions, and the earlier identification of sepsis via lactate, uh, of the, the availability of a lactate result. And uh, if we extend our POCT device remit to, um, to for example, the radio, radiometer HemaQ um, point of care testing device, then we could have um, theoretically a five part differential um, WBC result as well. Um, so, um, so all technically feasible and we're looking at, at connectivity for, la for, for the next phase of the project. Um, with regards to COVID and current work, so 
in my current work as the lead clinical analyst at Guys and St. Thomas's, we are looking at, uh, it's been very challenging <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, so in my current remit, I am looking at connectivity of medical devices with the hospital EPR system. So what, we, what we're looking at doing is um, connecting devices such as ECG machines, spot OBS, um, OBS vitals machines, and um, infusion pumps to, um, to the hospital ICU system. So that would be, in, in our case, CareView or eVision, um, and also to EPR for, for the um, vitals, OBS, and ECG um, uh, reports. So that's something that is beneficial, that you have connectivity, leads to data quality, and improved clinical outcomes. So that's one aspect of the work that I'm conducting. And then another aspect is we're looking at um, remote viewing of monitors within ICU departments. So as you can imagine, we want to limit the uh, exposure of clinicians to patients within that setting. So we looked at a project to um, monitor something called the Excel Tech EEG monitors within IC, adult ICU. So what, in effect, what that is is a clinician remotely can view, um, view the uh, results or availability of um, investigations on monitors remotely and monitor patients remotely, which, is, which I believe is, is fantastic for reducing that exposure and risk to the clinicians. Um, and also we, we want to extend that to um, monitoring uh, other uh, monitoring devices such as um, the uh, vitals, uh, observations and um, ECGs as well. So, so it's all it's all getting very busy and hectic, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, it's been very challenging. COVID has presented numerous problems um, with regards to healthcare scientists and how they conduct their work, how we conduct projects. Um, so, so at GSTT, the projects that we're conducting, it's almost impossible to get into that clinical environment. Um, which I've attempted to do, but um, it's proving to be impossible, um, areas being cordoned off. So I've had to kind of work remotely utilizing MS Teams, liaise with clinical stakeholders as to their requirements, um, producing workflows based on workshops, um, utilizing MS Teams and, and Zoom, for example, just as we are now. Um, and that's proved to be really um, fantastic and, and provided um, a great environment for me to be able to capture clinical requirements. Um, I can record the sessions um, and I can then construct my workflows and interventions and future plans based, based on, 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 that, on, those, on the requirements gathering exercise. Um, so yeah. Many thanks, Ash. Um, I think that's a, a really um, innovative um, use of technology going forward um, in the respect of um, yeah. CG machines and infusion pumps in ICU. Um, yes. are, there, are there any particular questions that are coming through on the chat just now? Um, I don't see anything up there at the moment, but um, I, I've got a question uh, mm. really for you, Ash, in the respect of um, point of care in the back of um, an ambulance yep. and um, how, how did you go about um, the training and the quality assurance and um, yes. obviously that's a huge clinical governance piece when we're utilizing point of care. Yep it is indeed and training um, was all important in this and we're talking about training paramedics that aren't really familiar with complex um, point of care testing diagnostic devices. Now there are advanced paramedics that do have some level of expertise, um, but training was, was all essential in, in our, in our uh, particular project, Karen. And you're quite right, the whole quality assurance aspect in terms of ensuring that those devices on a daily basis, so from the morning um, of the day when they, conducted the, they were conducting the days of the trial, we had to obviously assure that the, the quality of the um, results being produced by the ISTAT uh, in this case uh, was, was accurate and, and, um, and feasible. So, um, that, so the, the training was provided by the supplier. So Abbott kindly provided the training um, for, for the actual clinical users. Um, so yeah, yeah, training, 
very important for this. Thank you. Um, one last one, one for myself is, what, what advice would you give to potential applicants that are think or listening to, to you just now and yeah. are thinking of applying to next year's Advancing Healthcare Awards? Sure. Okay, so, so the reason that, that we, we applied for this particular award is we wanted to kind of raise a bit of awareness for the, um, the value of the project that we're conducting. So we, we believe that it's, if you have a passion for, you know, um, contributing to saving patient lives, um, then I think the AHA Awards is a fantastic uh, platform to raise awareness for any, for, for any such project. And so I, I think any applicants that are in future planning to um, perform such a project, then, um, then to apply for, for, for one of these awards and to raise awareness for their particular projects is a, is a fantastic opportunity. Um, yeah, so I would recommend anyone who has a, a project of value to, to definitely uh, apply for one of these. Super, sounds like really good advice. Um, many thanks for that. And as I said, there's an opportunity, hopefully at the end, uh, to uh, pick up any further questions. Um, by all means, put them into, uh, into the chat area. So that brings me on to our, our second range of speakers um, in today's session. And uh, they are from the Welsh Transfusion Laboratory, uh, part of the Welsh uh, Blood Service. Um, and that brings me to welcome Sandra Lloyd, who is the Head of Patient Services, um, and Amy Daraf, uh, who is a clinical, sci uh, clinical scientist um, in the Transplantation Laboratory. Uh, so can I ask uh, for your presentation, please? Hi, Karen. Thanks for that introduction. Um, myself and Sandra are both here. <laughs> Due to social distancing, I will now gracefully move the laptop over to me <laughs> and then I'll pass it back over to Sandra. Um, I'm just going to share a presentation with you all. One second, let me get that up. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm, my name's Amy and I'm here with my colleague Sandra. We're both clinical scientists in the Welsh Transplantation and Immunogenetics Laboratory. Uh, which is based in the Welsh Blood Service, which sits as part of the Lindra University NHS Trust. And uh, we're here today to talk about our project, which was introducing a virtual cross-matching strategy into um, solid organ transplantation. So firstly, just a little bit of background about transplantation um, within the UK. There's currently um, just over 6,000 people waiting for an organ transplant. Um, nearly 5,000 of those are waiting specifically for a kidney transplant. Uh, this graph shows you that um, year on year since 2010, actually the numbers of people waiting for a transplant, the black line along the top, is coming down. Um, the number of donors, however, is quite static and is slightly increasing. And you can see the number of transplants realised from those um, gifts of organs from those donors. There's still a big discrepancy between the number of people waiting for a transplant and the number of organs available. And that equates to three people dying every day whilst waiting for a transplant. Um, 16 of those people died in Wales last year. So the average time someone will wait for a kidney transplant on the deceased list um, is about months. And just for context, um, kidney services account for 3% of the whole NHS annual. So within the Welsh Transplantation and Immunogenetics Laboratory, our job is to assess the compatibility between donors and recipients. And to do that, we use three tests. So the first test we perform is HA typing. Um, you can see in the first arrow there, there's a simplified version of an HLA type. So your HLA type is a little bit like your um, ABO blood group, but a lot more complicated, as you can see from all the letters and numbers in that um, arrow. Um, your HLA antigens, you inherit half from your mother and half from your father, and they sit on your cell surface like little flags waving to your immune system to say um, that that cell is healthy and it's happy. Um, if one of those flags is missing, broken, or um, different, perhaps not present at all, that can signal things such as an infection um, or cancer even, uh, and your immune system will mount a response against that. So that's perfectly great. That's how you can stay happy and healthy, how your immune system works. But in the context of transplantation, that can cause a problem because it can result in rejection of a graft. 
So another form of testing we need to do is to look for antibodies to any HLA antigens you've previously been exposed to. So that could be through a previous transplant, through pregnancy, or even transfusion of blood products. The final test we do is cross-matching. We perform this pre-transplant where we test donor cells against patient antibodies. And it's the last check of compatibility we perform before um, the surgery is performed. So in the live donor context where a patient is lucky enough to have um, a, a relative or friend that's willing to give them um, a kidney, we can perform this cross-match test well in advance. However, in the deceased donor um, scenario, that testing is generally performed right before transplant and invariably in the middle of the night. So our improvement project was to try and tackle some of the issues this cross-matching test gave us. It's very time consuming. It takes between four and five hours of um, very labor intensive testing by an experienced clinical scientist. Um, so our intervention was to try and introduce something called the virtual cross-match policy. In that in a second. We wanted to improve patient outcomes. We wanted to make it beneficial to donors, lab staff, and the clinicians involved. And we also wanted to reduce costs, and we're hoping to get an environmental benefit from this introduction as well. So now I'm just going to cover actually what the virtual cross-matching protocol is. So we use information we already have, the HLA type of the patient and, and the antibody screening results of the patient. And we use those to predict the outcome of the cross-match test as if we had performed it in the laboratory. So, for instance, if um, the patient had an antibody against A2 um, and the um, donor graft what expressed the A2 antigen, we would say that that transplant cannot go ahead because it's likely that um, the patient would reject that organ. So in this way, we're performing the test um, using basically only a computer rather than coming into the laboratory to perform testing. So we first actually introduced a virtual cross-match protocol into the lab in 2011. Um, it was only introduced for non-complex patients, so patients who didn't really have any antibodies detected and who were waiting for a deceased donor organ. And then again in 2015, we did um, another extension to it and included more complex patients waiting for a deceased donor organ. In 2019, we again, um, extended this to include people who are waiting for a live donor and in 2020 we hope to extend it further to improve the equity of access to all the benefits that this um, program can bring to patients. So I just wanted to reiterate here that um, each iteration of the protocol as we introduce it we go through this change where we use clinical audit and we always assess against transfer outcomes to make sure we're doing the very best for patients because this a safe process and also to the donors who are um, giving these organs, we want to make the best use of them. So what impact has we seen since we've introduced this cross-matching protocol? Well, in the deceased donor scenario, around 26% of all our cross-matches are now assessed using the virtual cross-match and each time that saves us four hours of laboratory testing which means that we can accept donor organs much faster, 69% faster. That means the donor organs are stored on ice for less time, and that leads to improved transplant outcomes. In the live scenario, we've also seen a reduction in costs because we're performing 43% less cross-matching um, as part of their workup, and we've also allowed us to really streamline those workflows. We've also seen a difference um, to patients. So you can imagine someone who's been waiting for a deceased donor transplant for maybe two or three years, they suddenly get that phone call in the middle of the night, they have to come in and tend hospital, they rush to hospital and then they have to have blood taken and then they're left sitting on the ward for potentially four or five hours waiting for that cross match test result to know whether they will actually go to surgery and receive that organ. So if we use the virtual cross-matching protocol, that, that test, that test, I should say in inverted commas, because we're doing it virtually, um, is performed in a matter of minutes. And actually the patient will, might know before they even get to hospital whether that um, organ is suitable for them. So as you can see, that would alleviate considerable emotional stress on that patient. Uh, also in terms of living donors, they will also find out much faster if they're a suitable match for a loved one. 
and that means that there's a great reduction in the number of blood samples that need to be taken from them during their workup and they have to attend hospital fewer times. And in terms of transplant outcome, I mentioned before, the shorter the period we can keep that um, organ on ice, the better the outcome, the sooner the organ will start functioning once it's been transplanted. And that leads to short hospital stays and a reduce in comorbidity. In terms of the team, in laboratory staff wise, uh, on call staff have been called in for less hours. We have to attend site. So that means our staffing levels are more predictable the next, mm -hmm. next day because staff aren't having to have such long periods of compensatory rest. In terms of the hospital staff, so our surgeons, our transplant coordinators, and our nursing staff that we work with have also commented that this um, process really streamlines. They know they have a rapid turnaround of results and then they can get back to scheduling things like theatre slots and dealing with the patient. So it makes life much easier for them as well. And as I mentioned before, in terms of hospital attendances, the stays are shorter in hospital and less appointments have to be attended, which is very important for all social distancing, of course. Um, so sustainability wise, We've really seen a reduction in the time um, staff need to come in and attend during our social working hours in the middle of the night, which really improves our work-life balance. Cost savings, obviously there's less on-call hours work, so there's a saving there. We're using less lab resources, and for every year that we can maintain a patient with a functioning graft, we're saving the NHS £25,000 compared to that patient remaining on dialysis. So we're seeing that also because we've streamlined these workflows, we're seeing a reduction in workload. That means staff are under less stress. We have much more time to focus on research development and innovation projects, but it's also allowed for an increase in capacity, which is important because in 2015, a presumed consent law was introduced in Wales. And although it took a few years for um, the benefits to be realized, we're now seeing a 21% increase in donors um, that a similar law has been introduced in England in the spring and um, you might have heard of it referred to as Max and Kira's law. So if the same increase applies there, we need this capacity in order to test the increase in donors. So environmentally wise, we've also had an impact. We've reduced carbon emissions. Staff are not traveling to and from site in the middle of the night so much. And also uh, there's that reduction again in hospital appointments um, from patients and live donors. In terms of our laboratory testing, we use a lot of hazardous chemicals and plastic bubbles. They're all classed as biohazardous waste. It cannot be um, recycled. So it's really important that we reduce rather than have to reuse or recycle because we can't. So I'm now going to pass over to Sandra. She mute the laptop, sorry. And she'll <laughs> continue. Hello, hi. So I'm just going to go through a little bit about what impact COVID's had in on our work in general and also on our, our plans for virtual cross-matching. So uh, COVID had a dramatic impact on um, renal and pancreas transplantations. The, the programmes were paused in the benefits of patient safety. Um, these patients, although they need a transplant, there are other, other ways of keeping them um, reasonably well. So you don't want to put them at additional risk. So, you know, obviously pancreas patients can be maintained on insulin and our, our kidney patients on dialysis. Um, but the reasons for this is because the, they were put on pause was because the, the patients are considered to be at, at um, especially high risk of infection and to have um, poor risk outcomes um, if they were to succumb to the COVID-19 infection. So, so if you imagine for a patient who's, who's waiting to go onto the transplant list, they're already attending hospital three times a week for dialysis. So they're not able to self-isolate. So they're already at high risk of infection. Asking them to come in to sign consent papers or have blood taken to get them onto that transplant list is, a, is an additional risk that they didn't want to put them through. And for those patients who already had a transplant or you might consider transplanting at this time, they're then going to be on systemic immunosuppression for the life of that transplanted organ, which of course will reduce their capacity to um, uh, fight any COVID infection. So our workload took a sudden and dramatic 
um, downward trend. Um, it's important to note though that it didn't stop completely because we do sort of support other critical services within the lab. So for example, um, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation as you might be more familiar with, that had to continue because that is a life-saving event. So they had to continue with that during COVID. So we had to maintain our work to support that. Also as part of the um, another part of our work and being part of the blood transfusion service, we support patients who need um, platelet transfusions and who might have antibodies that are relevant um, to the success of that treatment. So we were still working. Um, it did mean, however, that we were able to sort of release some staff to um, help with the wider blood service. So we had a number of lab staff who went down to the other labs as part of the blood service and were helping to test and release the blood products, keep that blood supply chain ticking over. Um, we also had some clerical staff who went to help with the in the donor contact centre, contacting the donors to tell them about the new blood collection arrangements because we weren't able to collect blood in the same way that we normally do. Um, and we also had a few lab staff who uh, donned their aprons and their PPE and went out on the blood collection teams and helped with um, doing the, the basic tasks of, of disinfecting the, the chairs in between donations. So, so we felt that, you know, we, even though perhaps we, could, we felt a bit useless in our own work, we were able to, to help a very valuable service during this time. Um, it did, however, enable us to do some um, long, long needed um, research and development projects. Um, some of which are really going to help inform us in our next steps along the virtual cross-matching route because there's some new, well not, they're not new HLA types obviously, they've ever always been there, but with advances in technology over recent years we've started to recognise that there may be other things that are important in transplantation and uh, we just haven't had enough time to look at the data to see how important they are. So a lot of that's managed to go on in COVID and that will help us as we go on to the next steps in the virtual cross-match process. Um, in terms of the actual um, virtual cross-match process itself, we had a double impact in that um, just before we went into lockdown, Amy got um, a What's the word? I've lost the word. What? Seconded, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the effect of COVID, I can't think of words. Amy got seconded into a, a new post within the lab, so I've lost her as a, a resource to, um, to, to, to push this forward for a little while, but now things have started to calm down. Amy is starting to be able to look at this again, but obviously she had some other concerns to think about during that first part of lockdown. So, the good news and cause for celebration is that the transplant programme is up and running again. The transplant, the clinical transplant teams have done an awful lot of work in order to make sure that transplantation can proceed in a safe way for patients. Um, they've also had a look at what are the risks of having a transplant versus re remaining on dialysis. And it, they kind of even themselves out. Um, whilst you're on dialysis, your risks are more because you can't self-isolate, so your risks of infection are greater. Um, but, and then after transplant, you can self-isolate, but if you were to contract, contract the disease, your chances of, um, your prognosis is poorer. Um, you know, that's the initial work. More work really needs to be done, but obviously it's felt that it's safe to go ahead. However, the group of patients who, who are able to be transplanted is restricted at the moment. Um, but now that we have restarted, we are seeing rates of transplants similar to pre-COVID levels. But we really don't know at this time what the long-term impact is gonna be. You know, will we ever be able to get back to where we were before? In terms of our laboratory working, same as everyone else, we're having a new environment where we're we're in increased PPE, we're having to try and maintain social distancing. So we've brought in increased homework in, in order to support that. Um, and um, just, I'm not going to dwell on this too much because, um, oh, some of them didn't come through, so I go back. Um, but just, I, I think the, um, 
the benefits of um, virtual cross matching have really realised themselves during COVID-19. That reduced exposure of the patients, the less stress and everything is always going to, is going to be a huge impact benefit to um, transplantation in these difficult times. So just to quickly mention our plans for the future, we're starting to re-audit the current data again and our, our plans are to expand the pool of patients who, who can um, have a virtual cross match. We want to work with other centres to share the best practice. Virtual cross matching does happen in other labs but often in a different way, it means different things to them. We mean it to mean you don't do any lab testing, other labs do lab testing but they still call it virtual cross match. And as a result of this, we also want to publish our work. So thank you very much for listening. Many thanks uh, to Sandra and Amy there uh, for um, a great uh, clinical scientific presentation, um, which, uh, if, I'm, if I'm honest, really uh, takes me back to uh, my clinical days. Uh, that um, was originally my speciality was uh, transplantation. Um, if I'm having a quick look at the chat, see if there is any questions uh, for you there, but I don't see any. So uh, bear with me when I ask you, a, 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 can I guess a scientific question in respect of virtual cross-matching? So um, 2011, uh, nearly 10 years, um, I appreciate they were on sensitized patients, but has there been any um, scientific parallel studies done that's actually shown that um, a virtual cross match because it reduces the ischemia time um, has an impact on long-term long graft survival for patients? I don't think there's been anything that's directly linked to it. They, you know, these things are so, so complex, but there's definite, um, definite stuff out there that shows that cold ischemia time is one of the most important factors and probably is one that you know pretty much up there with being the most important factor to influence graph survival. Yeah, yeah. and um, you gave a, a really great overview of um, I guess the adaptability of healthcare science staff in being able to be redeployed into other uh, you know scientific specialised areas um, in, the, in the respect um, of the uh, current workload that you see coming through your laboratory at the moment, uh, what, what is your predicted um, state that you've not been able to transplant roughly? How did it impact when your services got shut down? Was there an estimation of um, complex cases that we could have been transplanting but weren't? Um, that's something very difficult to unpick, to be honest, because, you know, um, you can't reliably predict how many transplants you're going to get over a given period. You know, you can do eight one week and then nothing for a, a, a fortnight, you know, so it, it's very difficult. But there obviously there would have been patients who would have been transplanted in that time. Um, and I did have a look at the transplant list to see what, whether the patients who are currently still suspended, so anybody over the age of 60 is still, still suspended. So I had a look to see whether that, that adversely affected people in terms of, you know, was it more sensitized patients who've been suspended? But there's not, it's, it's very similar, um, you know, throughout the, the list. Um, but obviously those patients, you know, are missing out on a chance, but that age has been the biggest factor in, in um, the transplant group. It's the, the most important factor which leads to mortality as a result of COVID is age. So whether we'll ever be able to put those older patients back on the list, I don't know. Not for a, a while yet, I can imagine. So um, thank you ever so much, um, great presentation, uh, really good to hear of innovation and services moving forward within transplantation. Um, so I shall now take the opportunity uh, to move on to um, our third uh, speaker, who I believe is a, a pre-recorded session. Um, and this is uh, from Debbie Peet from um, Head of Medical Physics. Uh, Donna Riley, uh, newborn hearing screening manager, uh, Lisa Carter, 
um, the assistant manager for the newborn screening services. Um, they are from University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust and uh, the title of their work was uh, Back to Basics in Newborn Hearing Screening. Thank you. My name is Donna Riley. I'm the Newborn Hearing Screening Programme Manager for Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. Hi, I'm Lisa Carter. I'm Assistant Manager for Newborn Hearing Screening for Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. And today we're going to talk about our Back to Basics initiative. Um, this evolved from our rising referral rate from 2.5% to 3% during 2007-2014-15. The impact of the rising um, referral rate, uh, it, we had increased parental anxiety, there was more hospital visits to families, increased workload to us, for our staff, um, a risk of not meeting national standards and a decrease in staff morale and motivation. So we had to get our thinking caps on um, to see how we could reduce our referral rate. So our investigations uh, included looking at the age of screening, our staffing levels, our screening equipment and review of screening performance. The first of three of those were all inconclusive and didn't appear to have any impact. So we looked at our screening performance and as you can see here, the red is the clear response rate, the green is the not complete and the purple here is the um, AABR rate. So ideally the purple should be nice and low along with the green and the red should be nice and high, preferably at this time above 60% which has now rise to 70 to 75%. So the Back to Basics initiative um, was born and we did a presentation to the screeners of the um, increase in the referral rate and the impact that it would have on parental anxiety and workloads, etc. And the um, impact on um, the audiologist workload as well. So a drive was born for this to go from a 3.5% referral rate, which is about 35 babies a month, to a 2% referral rate of about 20 a month, which meant about one baby less referred per month per screener. So we looked at a refresher on the key performance indicators and the standards and we found that by providing the screeners with knowledge this gave them power. So we looked at education and training and we looked back at the basics um, training of newborn hearing screening. So optimising screening conditions, making sure babies are settled, checking for debris, um, standing on the ear to be side of the ear to be screened, um, correct earpiece fit and screening technique, and um, making sure the environment um, was the best it could be. So the outcome of this was, as you can see here, 2019, the red, so the clear response rate is well up in the 70s, sometimes 80%. The not complete rate is significantly reduced along with the need for AAVRs. The less AAVRs we do, the less um, referrals we're going to get. So by improving the technique of the OAE and the first um, result, we reduce parental anxiety and also um, significant cost benefits to us as well. So this is standard two. Um, so we are, this is um, the acceptable standard here at 27 and the achievable is 22. As you can see across the region, um, the majority of places don't reach the achievable limit, whereas Leicester is here at 19.4%, so we've achieved well below the um, achievable level. So sustainability of the Back to Basics initiative um, is demonstrated over here with the green of just keeping the, ref um, the performance quite level um, throughout the time. 
we've got the lower numbers down here and these screeners are now achieving well above um, the standard and this just goes to show there as a, as a whole. So the impact of the Back to Basics campaign has been um, performance management. Screeners get um, notified of their um, screening statistics every month and where we offer guidance, reflection um, and support. We've managed to do um, screening on paediatric wards, the um, increasing patient coverage, having to prevent those parents having to come back to our patient clinics. We've done presentations to engage other professionals um, and to encourage screening um, attendance at clinics. We've allowed um, time for telephone reminders and referral appointments and we've been able to um, start a domiciliary service um, which we do before and after clinics. So these are our key performance indicators, um, key performance one and key performance two. Um, key performance one is our um, making sure that we complete the screens by four weeks corrected age. And you can see from 2015-16 to 2018-19 that we've improved. And KPI two is to make sure that our referrals from the screen are seen in a timely manner and as you can see, um, always in the green, but um, maintaining very well. So we did some benchmarking um, just to make sure that um, this was transferable, that our initiative was transferable to other sites. And also we were part of an audit for Public Health England um, and was, we were one of the best performing sites achieving KPI 2. We also did a parent satisfaction um, survey and these are some of the comments from the satisfaction survey. And this is the team uh, pre-COVID I would like to say. And this is some of the screen and reflection comments. Uh, we have some national recognition here. Um, presentation of Back to Basics, we did that at the National Symposium. There was a blog written about our Back to Basics. Um, request from Birmingham to um, present our Back to Basics initiative. Uh, and we were examiners on the National OSCE. And we have involvement in the steering group uh, for the e-learning package that all screeners need to complete in their training. So what's next? Well, we've got some changes to children's services, researching possibilities of posting a masterclass for screeners to improve screening, um, especially during this time, it would be beneficial to make sure that all screening standards are improved to um, alle alleviate the um, outpatient activity um, and how has COVID-19 affected our work? Well um, initially we had um, to close some of our clinic venues which did have an effect on our coverage um, which was reduced from 99.8% um, to 95.4% um, our referral rate actually was maintained at 2.5% and interestingly enough our quality of screening during this time although um, it was difficult with um, all the staff having to incorporate all the changes, PPE um, and the worry of uh, what was happening and um, our quality of screening was not affected in 2019, 2020 and we were at that point 20% within the achievable range um, January, March quarter four where the national target is less than 22. Uh, this is the team now uh, and full PPE but uh, underneath those masks I, still, I think they're still smiling. Mm. Have you got any questions?
Um, many thanks, uh, Donna and uh, Lisa, for your presentation there. Um, am I correct in saying that um, Debbie, Donna and Lisa are all with us at the moment? If there's any questions that comes up in the chat, by all means, pop something there. Um, but just to kind of kick off from myself, um, what do you think was one of the main challenges of um, embedding your work? And do you think that being one of the finalists within the um, Advancing Healthcare Awards has provided you with an opportunity to promote uh, the work that you're doing? I think one of the challenges um, is um, when screeners have been working a long time and doing the job for a long time, the challenge then was to improve that screening. Um, I think by um, being awarded this award for um, healthcare scientists, it will um, raise our profile and hopefully um, we would then like to, um, as I said in the presentation, we would like to do some presentations or certainly some masterclasses in screening, um, be it now virtually, I would think. And have you have you recently been uh, utilising them technology in that virtual way to to carry out training, or is that work kind of on hold at the moment due to our current situations? Well, it's been on hold, but even um, sending the video through to Rachel, we've had to record it, we've had to send it. We're learning all the time, um, so um, I don't think it's something that um, worries us now, as it probably would have done. Um, prior this, we're certainly starting to learn a lot more about technology. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think it gave um, a really great example of uh, motivating um, a team, bringing it together, um, and some very impressive uh, results there with regards to um, your referral rates um, going down. So um, great work. Um, I'm just going to one last ask if there's any questions that anyone wants to put to um, any of our three presentations that we've had. Um, so I see something up in here. So this is for um, Ash uh, from uh, Lauren Crawford. Um, or any other ambulance trusts looking to pick up the point of care testing? So that's a good question. Now, Frimley Park have already um, conducted a study, prior, even prior to us. So uh, they beat us to it. But, but what they did was... Um, the complexity of that being in in that particular area um that it was kind of it's not it's not on the scale of london where you have multiple hospitals um and um and a centralized service london ambulance service catering for all those hospitals whereas they in frimley park were very kind of like isolated in one area so it was quite simple to to connect the um the ambulance uh the POCT device within the ambulance to the Frimley Park Hospital. It was just a direct connection. Whereas with London, uh, if you can imagine, an ambulance can end up in any of the hospitals distributed throughout the metropolitan city. So hugely more complex, um, vastly more intricate in terms of um, ascertaining what that connect connectivity is going to be and how to resolve that and the technical issues involved in that and that's what we aim to address with this with this project thanks very much ash and i, I mean i think it's probably worthy to say that um with covid covid19 at the moment is the connectivity of rapid testing or point of care testing um it is something that is happening at pace um, with regards yeah. to the innovation space at this moment in time. Um, if, there, if there isn't any um, more questions, um, I'm going to take this opportunity to um, thank all of our speakers and uh, sincerely wish them all the very best when the, uh, the finalist is announced in October. Um, you are all worthy um, of obviously of that award. Some great um, presentations there with some really um, excellent um, innovative uh, service improvements. Um, so a thank you from me. Um, thank you for the individuals who have logged in to uh, listen to the presentations um, and I shall hand back uh, to uh, Joy to close out. Many thanks. So thank you so much Karen for chairing the webinar so well and thank you to Scottish Government for sponsoring this award and also the one for allied health professionals. Um, I, 
I echo your thoughts in thanking all the finalists for taking the time to join us today. As you said, Karen, these are really important projects that are highly transferable and uh, we hope that we'll see you sharing them even further in the coming months. Um, this webinar is a series of uh, webinars. Um, the next one up for healthcare scientists is um, on the 9th of September, which is the Biopath Award. Um, so please put that in your diary. And equally, as Karen also mentioned, um, these, the winners of all the awards will be announced at the virtual ceremony on the 16th of October. Uh, and all the details are on the website and registrations for that will be open very soon. Um, so uh, just take a look at the website or keep your eye on Twitter or on our emails. Um, so thank you again for everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week and um, thank you for joining us.